I would like to thank the organizers of the Herodotus Helpline for giving me the opportunity to talk about a topic um, I've been working on for a couple of months, I have to say. Um, and I was inspired by many people. Some of them are as guests here. And I, in advance, I ex, um, ask for excusing the, the density of my paper. I will talk about uh, 45 minutes. The second book of Herodotus Histories is equally important for classical philology, ancient history, and Egyptology, either as a historical source or as a, a key to the understanding of Herodotus histories themselves. At the same time, the Egyptian logos repres uh, represents an, a challenging red for the modern reader. This is due on the one hand to the range of topics covered by Herodotus, stretching from the geography of Egypt to the customs and uh, religious practices of the ancient Egyptians, to the history of earlier Egyptian kings and to the more recent Sayyid dynasty. On the other hand, Herodotus' complex narrative style plays a major role, which is characterized by the following features among others. Narr narrative circles of thematically connected episodes, alternative versions, excurses, allusions, doublets, and so on. The history of the early Egyptian kings poses a particular challenge. While Herodotus Sayyid history at least as far as on the chronology is concerned, is considered quite reliable. And the absence of relevant Egyptian sources still forms an important basis for the modern reconstruction of the 26th dynasty. The history of the early kings is notorious for its weird chronology in which the pyramid builders of the old kingdom apparently follow kings of the middle and new kingdoms. At the same time, many of the stories Herodotus tells about these kings seem fantastic and without any historical basis. Recent Egyptological research has been able to contribute substantially to the possible Egyptian models um, behind Herodotus' uh, stories, showing that for mythical kings such as Sesostris or Pharaohs, Egyptian narrative circles certainly existed, which Herodotus ev evidently made use of. Nevertheless, many questions about the structure of the historical part of the second book, in particular, still remain unanswered. How can the weird chronology of Herodotus' history of the early Egyptian kings be explained? What ordering principles underlie Herodotus' compilation of stories about these kings? Did Herodotus merely record what came to his ears? Or did he made, make a um, deliberate selection from a rich pool of Egyptian stories? These questions will be explored in the following. This paper will also take into account more recent scholarship in classical philology, which deals with Herodotus' political agenda and literary means, using the example of the Cambyses Logos. And uh, you may allow me to refer here to the um, conference proceedings, Herodotian soundings, the Cambyses Logos, which will come out in April of this year, hopefully. Um, which immediately follows the Egyptian logos and forms its framework. The question of the extent to which the Cambyses logos and the Egyptian logos can be related to each other will be explored um, in the following. In this paper, a somewhat unusual path will be taken in which first the role of places, 
things and monuments and related stories in Herodotus Logos on Egypt will be uh, studied in order to then draw further conclusions with regard to the composition of the second book. Um, there are good reasons to do so, because in addition to a very precise labeling of his sources, Herodotus repeatedly mentions places, things, and monuments that are supposed to serve as material testimonies of his histories. And let me begin with the places and the oracle of Buto. A look at the places mentioned in the second book of um, the histories reveals two things. And here I would like to thank the, um, especially the student uh, helpers of the uh, Bonn Herodotus project who um, made the, uh, who gathered the data and um, made this visualization you can see here possible. On the one hand, the Egyptian Logos is not about Egypt alone, rather it is to be understood as a history of the relations between Egypt and Greece. And I think this map nicely illustrates this. So uh, there are two clusters of places, as you can see. There's, of course, the Egyptian Nile Delta, but you can also see that uh, there are plenty of places from the <clears throat> Aegean Sea. Um, plotted here on the map because they are mentioned in book two. On the other hand, the Logos clearly shows Herodotus' specific view of a Greek traveler on late period Egypt. That means that cities in the, Egypt, in the Egyptian Nile Delta play a significant role. This is shown not least by a look at the top 10 cities mentioned by in the book, uh, the second book of the histories. It may not be surprising that uh, Memphis comes first since Memphis has always been the coron coronation city of the Egyptian pharaohs and in the fifth century BC, the seat of the Persian satra. Memphis also housed impressive buildings which Herodotus describes in great detail and which plays, play a role in the, uh, his history of the early Egyptian kings as will be shown later. However, the remains uh, visible today in Mitrahina, ancient Memphis, we are only limited witness to the splendor of this ancient capital. From the Greek point of view, Memphis was also important because in addition to Naucratis, Greek mercenaries, traders and travelers had settled here in particular. The ancient traveler, could uh, also not avoid passing the great pyramids of Giza on the way to Memphis, which were much closer to the Nile at the time than, uh, than they are today. The frequency with, uh, which were, with which the pyramids are mentioned in book two shows that Herodotus had dealt intensively with them and their history. Indeed, the builders of the pyramids were to play a prominent role in the history of the early Egyptian kings, as will be discussed later too. Sais and Naucratis were certainly among the cities in the Nile Delta that Herodotus must have seen first when he visited Egypt. Sais was the uh, residence of the um, former 26th dynasty under which Greeks and Carians first settled in Egypt in large numbers. It must still have existed in full splendor in the time of Herodotus. However, not much of the splendor can be seen in Sa'il Haka, ancient Sais nowadays. The latter is also true um, of ancient Naucratis, the Greek trading center founded um, under the 26th dynasty, not far um, away from the residence um, of Sais, which uh, Herodotus gives a large place um, to at the end of book two. The other cities of our top 10, on the other hand, are religious centers in the Nile Delta, such as Ubastis, Usiris, or Heliopolis, 
whose architecture and religious festivals are described and derived in great detail. As these examples already suggest, Herodotus does not provide a mere description of Egyptian places. Rather, these places have their own function in the ancient author's narrative. This is especially true of um, one place in our top 10 whose prominence in the Egyptian Logos is particularly surprising, and that's Bhutto. Bhutto is mentioned in a total of 10 passages in book two, spread over both the description of the country and the historical section. The first time he mentions the place in, is in uh, 259, in which he lists the most important religious festivals in Egypt. And the festival for Leto of Bhutto takes uh, fifth place here, right after Heliopolis and before Paprimis. A short time later, Herodotus reports that the people uh, would only sacrifice during the festivities at Heliopolis and Bhutto. According to 267, shrew mice and hawks were buried at Bhutto. Herodotus thus gives Bhutto, along with uh, Babastis and Hermopolis, its place in the uh, animal cult, cult, which was particularly flourishing in late period Egypt. In 283, Herodotus enumerates the oracle gods of Egypt, whereby Leto of Bhutto is particularly emphasized. While the previous mentions of Bhutto are found in his Herodotus' a description of Egyptian cults, the ancient author firmly inscribes the oracle and the history of Egyptian kings as the following three examples will show. Herodotus begins with uh, the enig enigmatic king Pharos, who was prophesied uh, by the oracle of Bhutto that he would be cured of his 10 year blindness if he washed his eyes with the urine of a woman who had intercourse only with her own husband. Pharos first took the urine of his own wife, however, without any cure. He then tried many other women, each time without success. After he was finally cured, he gathered all these women except the one who had cured him in a city called in a city called Red Clay and burned them with the city. Then he married the woman, a woman who cured him from his blindness. Herodotus mentions two obelisks that King Pharaoh had erected in Heliopolis after um, his healing. The mention of monuments as witnesses is quite typical of Herodotus' Egyptian logos, as we shall see later. And Herodotus is not at all wrong when he places um, obelisks, especially in Heliopolis. The case is different for King Pharos. The name Pharos is not to be associated with the historical king, but is merely, merely the Greek rendering of the Egyptian royal title Pharaoh. However, it should be noted that the, the story of Pharaoh, Pharaoh or Pharos, who is cured of his blindness by the bodily fluid of a faithful wife, in that case, tears is attested as one of the original 70 um, short stories of the Egyptian narrative circle around the priest Peteese. The Peteese stories are attested for the first time by fragments from Saqqara, dating to the fourth century BC. And um, this example strongly shows that Herodotus did indeed new Egyptian stories. Yeah. Later, the oracle of Bhutto predicts um, to King Mukarinos that he will die in his seventh year uh, after um, of reign because of the th sins of his predecessors, predecessors. The king was outraged by the oracle saying that as a pious king, he would soon have to die while his predecessors had closed temples, disre disrespected gods, and destroyed people, and yet had lived long lives. Finally, he decided to celebrate day and night in order to gain 
uh, 12 years out of his remaining six and thus uh, tricking the oracle of Buto. Herodotus here obviously reworks Egyptian stories. The story of King Sisobek, who had only one week to live, is also found in the Egyptian papyrus Vendier from the 7th or 6th century BC. There, the king sends the magician Mary Ray into the underworld to gain more lifetime. In the frame story of the Peteese stories, already mentioned, a ghost tells the priest Peteese that he has only 40 days to live. And the motive that the ruler's wrongs eventually fall on his son is found later in the Demotic Chronicle. Finally, the oracle of Buto prophesied to the founder of the 26th dynasty, Psammeticus I, that he would take revenge on the 11 kings who had driven him out when he will see men of bronze coming out of the sea. Psammeticus did not quite believe that bronze men would come to his aid, but a short time later, Ionians and Carians were stranded on the coast of Egypt on a raiding exhibition. They disembarked from their ships in their armor. And a local who had never seen men in armor before carried the news to the royal court that bronze men had come from, come from the sea. With the help of Ionians and Carians, Psammeticus I finally succeeded in bringing um, all Egypt under his rule. This is the beginning of 200 years of Greek involvement in Egypt which would last from the Sayyid dynasty at least to the Inarus revolt in the middle of the 5th century BC. It is surely no coincidence that he had already been appointed as king before by a bronze helmet, fulfilling an oracle as well. Um, through a bronze helmet, Amasis was later also be promoted uh, to kingship. That the oracle saying for Psammeticus I, which firmly inscribed, firmly inscribed the Greeks in Egyptian history, represented a certain climax is also shown by the fact that it was followed by a detailed description of the sanctuary itself. As these examples show, Herodotus pursued a narrative strategy in his characterization of Buto. He built up the Egyptian sanctuary, which was certainly little known to the Greek audience, into the Egyptian oracle par excellence, which had an active influence on the fortunes of Egyptian kings and even predicted the foundation of the Sayyid dynasty. The significant role of oracles in Herodotus' histories as a whole is evident not least um, in the stories described in book two. But um, what about the um, actual cult of um, um, in Bhutu? What can we say about this? The sanctuary of Vajit of Bhutu played an important role for Egyptian kingship, um, that's for sure. Along with Nechbet of Necheb at uh, El Kaab, the de deity was considered one of the two protecting goddesses of, of the Egyptian king. That this goddess was still relevant in the Sayyid period can be seen in a number of bronzes that, uh, bronzes that uh, came come from the residential city of Sais. In the much younger Satrap Stili, um, the later Ptolemy I assigns lands to the temple of Wajet of Buto. Despite this importance, our knowledge of the sanctuary at Buto in Herodotus' times is extremely limited. Although the Sayyid period temple of um, Wajet was identified at Kombi in the northeastern part of the uh, site, the excavators just found a mass of temple blocks uh, scattered around. This led to the assumption that the temple has been destroyed by the Persian king Cambyses. However, Herodotus reports nothing of this, although it would have fitted very well into his characterization of Cambyses. 
Rather, he describes the splendor of the temple, while a seal with the name of Cambyses underlines the veneration of the goddess Vajet of Bhutto, even by the great king himself. Cambyses is also the right keyword when it comes to the question of why Herodotus characterizes Bhutto as the Egyptian oracle par excellence. Bhutto is mentioned one more time, not in book two, but in a passage at the beginning of book three, in which Herodotus describes the tragic end of the great king. Cambyses had um, had um, his brother Smerdis murdered and concealed his death. This gave a certain Gaum Gaumata the opportunity to pretend to be this um, Smerdis and proclaim himself as a king. The great king hastily departed Egypt to return to the Persian heartland. And in Ekbatana in Syria, he jumped from his horse and wound wounded himself with his sword on his leg at the same spot where he had once wounded the sacred Apis bull. Horrified, Cambyses remembered uh, the oracle of Bhutto, which had prophesied that he would die at Ekbatana. The great king thought he would die in old age in the former capital of the Medes. Instead, the oracle had predicted his early death in Ekbatana in Syria. The oracle of Bhutto thus plays a decisive role in the tragic death of the tyrant, who can also be recognized by the fact that he misinterprets oracles. A similar fate befell his predecessor Cyrus, as well as the Lydian king Croesus, who, with, who not without reason makes another guest appearance and the Cambyses Locos at the beginning of Book 3. Oracles are known to play a central role as drivers of human action in Herodotus', Herodotus histories. The fate of his protagonists is all too often revealed in their um, dealings with the oracles. This is particularly evident in the case of the Sayyid king Amasis, who does not follow the usual pattern of Eastern despots and even makes a rich gift to the oracle of Delphi. The oracle of Bhutto, on the other hand, was probably only slightly familiar to Herodotus' Greek audience, which is why Herodotus introduced it in a, in a intriguing manner in the second book of the histories, so that he could presume knowledge of this oracle in his description, the, in his description of the tragic death of Cambyses. The example of Bhutto vividly shows that the Egyptian logos and the Cambyses logos are closely linked. The Egyptian logos is virtually an excursus from the Cambyses logos, which already begins actually in Herodotus 2.1. Bhutto, by the way, is not the only Egyptian place that should still play a role in the logos of Cambyses. The same can be said um, for Memphis and the necropolis of Sais. Um, and I will show now that not only places um, are suitable to illustrate the connection be the, between these two logoi. Let me um, continue with things and the priest plate of Amasis. To understand Herodotus' treatment of Egyptian matters, it is worth looking at his characterization of the Sayyid king Amasis. That the penultimate king of the Sayyid dynasty was of particular importance to Herodotus can be seen simply from the fact that he gives the Sayyid king almost twice as much space uh, in his histories as his predecessors combined. Herodotus forms an, an entire narrative circle around this king, from his usurpation of the Egyptian throne, his dealings with oracles and his fellows, his daily routine, his cult politics, his legislation, to his friendships with the Greeks. 
There are at least uh, two reasons why Amasis plays such a major role in Herodotus. The Sayyid king was one of the best known Egyptian kings of his time in the Greek world, thanks to his extensive alliance policy with Greek city-states, especially with Polycrates of Samos. The stories Herodotus knows to tell about Amasis can certainly be traced back in part to Egyptian narrative material as well, especially for the description of the legendary drinking skills of this king, there's a long known parallel in the in demotic narrative literature, the story of Amasis and the skipper. And the description of his administrative reforms, um, Herodotus Amasis bears striking similarities to the mythical king Sesostris. In addition, Werner Müller also assumed that Amasis novellas circulated even in the Greek world which um, Herodotus uh, could draw on to enrich his account of the Sayite king. Herodotus, however, did not simply compile what had come to his ears. Rather, he quite con consciously formed his own analysis. And things play a significant role in Herodotus' logos on analysis. It starts with the fact that he was appointed by a soldier placing a bronze helmet on his head, surely an allusion to the appointment of the founder of the dynasty Psammeticus I by a bronze helmet. Later, Amasis uses a golden food washing, food washing basin to con convince the Egyptians of the legitimacy of his rule. He had the basin recast in a golden statue of a deity, which was immediately worshipped by the Egyptians. Likewise, they were to worship Amasis, a simple soldier who had become king. Also noteworthy is the allegory of the bow that Amasis uses to justify his daily routine. The Sayyid king used to spend only half a day on governor, uh, governing the country, and the rest of the day drinking and partying, which earned him the criticism of the courtier. He calmly replied that even a bow could not always be drawn, but needed to be relaxed. It was the same of the it's the same of the government business. Too much tension would lead to madness. Here one, one could see an allusion to the later Cambyses, who was quite unsuccessful with the bow, be it in drawing the bow that had come as a guest gift from the Ethiopians, or in trying to kill Croesus uh, by shooting at him. Indeed, Herodotus Amasis seems like a positive antithesis to hapless tyrants like Croesus, Cyrus, and especially Cambyses as I will show in my contribution to the forthcoming volume, Herodotian Soundings. It is also remarkable how Herodotus characterized the alliance policy of Amasis by listing the gifts that the Sayyid king gave to the Greek city-states. He donated a gilded statue of Athena and a painted royal portrait to Cyrene, two stone statues and a linen armor to Athena of Lindos, two wooden royal statues to Hera of Samos. The latter was still to be seen in the Herion of Samos as late as the time of, the, as the time of Herodotus. The gifts and votive offerings listed by Herodotus were undoubtedly intended to underline the accuracy of his statements. The offerings to Lindus are at least confirmed in the temple inventory of the later Lindus Chronicle. In one case, such a gift was still to have an afterlife. A linen breast plate similar to the, uh, to the one donated to Lindus was to get the tyrant Polycrates of Samos into trouble at the beginning of book three. Under Polycrates, the Samians were known to plunder throughout the Aegean. They had also looted a, a linen armor that Amasis wanted to send to the Spartans, as well as a crater, 
that the Spartans in turn wanted to send to Croesus, the king of Lydia. Polycrates' unscrupulousness eventually led the Spartans to take up arms against Samos. Polycrates and Amasis were in turn bound by a special friendship, which came to an end when Amasis found that Polycrates would meet and bet a bad end. He became convinced of this after hearing the story of Polycrates' ring. The Sayite king had asked the tyrant to part with something precious, as one cannot always be lucky. Polycrates therefore had a ring thrown into the sea, but it was eaten by a fish and returned to him. It is not without irony that the linen arm of his former friend Amasis should get the tyrant into trouble. The story about the stolen linen armor of Amasis at the beginning of book three gained um, particular plausibility through the detailed description of Amasis votive gifts at the end of uh, book two. That's what is important for me um, at this point. And now I would like to show you that also monuments um, uh, play their uh, certain role in uh, the book two. This is the third and uh, last part of my lecture. Monuments, along with places and things, played a prominent role in Herodotus' Egyptian logos. Monuments function as testimonies for the stories Herodotus knows to tell. This is particularly evident in Herodotus' history of the early Egyptian kings. The history includes a handful of kings attested by name who <clears throat> would have ruled over Egypt after a long period of over 330 nameless kings. It consists of longer narratives, such as the one on Ramsinitos, uh, whole narrative circles, like the one on uh, the mythical king Sesostris, even excurses, like the uh, excurse on um, um, the, um, the Greek um, Rodophis, and of course, doublets, uh, like, uh, such as repeating stories on princesses, as prostitutes. Interestingly, each king is associated with one or several monuments, and that's what you can see here on the slide. Herodotus' accuracy is striking when it, he refers Naoi to Amasis or obelisks to Heliopolis. In fact, Amasis erected several Naoi in all over Egypt during his lengthy reign. Some of the monuments are directly linked to the stories Herodotus is telling, such as the stories on Pharos, Cheops, or Mykerinos. They may go back to Egyptian monument novellas, as Wilhelm Spiegelberg has pointed out um, a long time ago, that the stories the Egyptians them themselves um, related to particular monuments in the time of Herodotus, of course. That Herodotus presents Egypt's, Egypt's history as an architectural history in which the pyramids of Giza play a prominent role may not be surprising. Since Herodotus wanted to present the erga of uh, the vari various peoples, which according to Andreas Schwab, explicitly included remarkable monuments. Monuments. Nevertheless, it is worth taking a look at how Herodotus uh, stages this um, building history. One close, on closer inspection, the history of the early, early Egyptian kings turns out to be a, a, a schematic construction history of the temple of Hephaestus in Memphis. The first king to be attested by name, Min, makes the beginning by founding the temple. Later, the king Moiris erects a portico on the north of the temple. 
King Proteus erects a sacred precinct in the south of the temple. Ramsinitos erects a portico in the west of the temple as well as two statues. After an interruption by the pyramid builders comes Asushis, who erected a portico in the east of the temple. Building activities continue under the, the Sayite kings. The dynasty founder, Psammeticus I, for instance, erected a portico in the south of the temple, as well as a courtyard for the sacred Erpus Bowl. And the result of this lengthy description of building activities at Memphis was a schematic, but as you can see here, complete description of the Hephaestus temple, at least in Herodotus' times. Remarkable is the chronologically weird insertion of the three pyramid builders, Cheops, Chefren, and Mykarinos, which not least breaks the construction history of the temple of Hephaestus. However, this can be explained quite logically. King Asusius, who had a portico built to the east of the temple of Hephaestus, was at the same time known as the builder of a mud brick pyramid. Since the time of the pyramid builders was described as a time of decline, it was only logical to place the builder of a mud brick pyramid, not made of stone as before, after the kings Cheops, Cherfen, and Mykarinos. Claude Upsomer had already assumed two different sources that Herodotus had combined into one narrative. Herodotus had learned the stories of the first kings from priests of the temple of Hephaestus, but those of the pyramid builders from the Egyptians, apparently not from Egyptian priests. Herodotus, who certainly had no idea of the chronology of ancient Egyptian history, thus placed the kings of the old kingdom after those of the, of the middle and new kingdoms for reasons of a formal content. This explains the um, peculiar chronology of the early Egyptian kings. There is, however, another connecting element between the individual episodes of a Herodotus history. Stories about princesses and courtesans. In 2, 111 to uh, 135, there's a whole cluster of stories that revolve around princesses who have to prostitute themselves, unfaithful wives, and courtesans. The best known of these stories is certainly that of uh, Cheops' daughter. The king of the Egyptian fourth dynasty and builder of the largest pyramid on the Giza plateau is, is described by Herodotus as a cruel despot who closed temples and forced people into servitude. Cheops finally went so far as to send his own daughter to a brothel to raise um, a certain amount of money. Uh, this daughter had asked for an additional stone from each client in order to build herself a pyramid as a monument. So far, there's no direct evidence that this is a proper Egyptian story. That the Egyptians themselves remembered King Cheops, who lived about 2,000 years before, is, on the other hand, well documented by corresponding monuments. Graffiti of priests for a cult of Cheops and a stela, the so-called stela of Cheops' daughter, are known from the late period temple of Isis, a lady of the pyramids, at a foot, a foot of the small side pyramids next to the Cheops pyramid. This stela mentions, among other things, that Cheops built a pyramid for the king's daughter, Henut Sen, who is, interestingly, not attested uh, through Old Kingdom sources. Therefore, an Egyptian background to the story can certainly assumed. Joachim Quack speculated whether the Egyptian term for small pyramid, Mehaneches, was reinterpreted in the late period as pyramid of the prostitute due to the fact that 
Necheset in turn means prostitute or can mean prostitute. The motive of the king forcing his daughter into prostitution also already appears under Ramsinitos. Later, the Pyramid of Mykerinos is associated with a Crete courtesan named Rodophis. With the excursus on Helen and Rodophis, Herodotus even succeeds in inscribing the Greeks in the early history of Egypt. Helena easily ranks among the princesses who were mere, merely the, the toys of powerful men. At the same time, he takes up a contemporary Greek legend when he deals with the elite pyramid of Rodophis. More indirectly related to these stories is that of the Cyrenian princess Ladike, who was married to the Syriate king Amasis for political reasons and donated a cult image to Aphrodite in Cyrene so that Amasis could attend her. It is said of Ladike that Cambyses sent her back home after the conquest of Egypt. And by doing so, Herodotus inserts a cliffhanger that would uh, to what is to come afterwards the three stories of why Cambyses went to Egypt. At the center of these stories is the king's daughter, Nitetis, who, according to one version, had been sent by Amasis to the great king for marriage. Unwilling to send his own daughter, Amasis passed off the daughter of his predecessor, Apries, as his own. Cambyses moved against Egypt in anger after Nitetis had confessed this fraud of Amasis. From this perspective, it can be concluded that Herodotus was not only reproducing royal stories that he had picked up in Egypt. While such stories certainly existed in demotic narrative literature, as the example of the Petaeus stories um, has shown, it can be assumed that Herodotus deliberately chose these stories in order to combine them into a thematically coherent narrative circle. The entertainment value of these stories cannot be denied. In my opinion, however, there's more to it than that. While this circle of stories, with this circle of stories, Herodotus thematically prepared the story about the fraud of Amasis at the beginning of book three. Let me conclude. In this lecture, I've tried to show by means of the way Herodotus deals with Egyptian places, things and monuments and the stories behind them, how closely the Egyptian logos and the Cambyses logos are linked. Indeed, the logos on Egypt is to be understood as a lengthy excursus from the Cambyses logos. Using Bhutto as an example, I try to show how Herodotus systematically builds up an Egyptian place that was certainly little known among the Greeks into a, an oracle par excellence in order to then use the oracle in a key episode of the histories, the tragic death of Cambyses at the beginning of big book three. A guest gift from Amasis was in turn to get the tyrant Polytrates into trouble calling the Spartans into action. By extensively describing the gifts of the Sayite king in book two, Herodotus laid ground for the story about the priest plate of Amasis in book three. Lastly, I have shown how Herodotus used Egyptian monuments, such as the Temple of Hephaestus in Memphis, or the pyramids of Giza, and Egyptian stories associated with them to construct his version of Egyptian history. That this is a Herodotian construct is evident not least in the narrative circle around princesses and courtesans, which can be read as a prelude to the Nitete story and the reason for Cambyses' war against Egypt at the beginning of book three. For the Egyptologist like me, 
This explains the disparity that characterizes the historical part of the Egyptian logos. Much of what Herodotus relates in it has either a direct reference to the Greeks or to the logos of Cambyses at the beginning of book three. The letter is an important key to, uh, the, uh, to understand Herodotus' agenda, especially the critique of the Athenian expansionist policies in Herodotus' own time, as, for instance, Liz Irwin pointed out at several occasions. The warning against despotic hubris is a key theme here, stretching from Croesus and Cyrus in Book 1 to Gabaisis in Book 3 and Xerxes in Book 4. Book 2 is not an exception here, for, it's full, for it is full of Egyptian despots, such as Pharaohs, Cheops, or Apries, and what monument could be better embody despotic hubris than the pyramids of Giza? Thank you for your attention.